Dr. Juan Riera is a native of Miami and earned a BA from the University of Florida, a master's from Florida International University, and a PhD from Texas Tech. His areas of interest include colonial Latin American history with an emphasis on Florida and maritime history of the Spanish Empire, archaeology, and museum studies. Dr. Riera currently works at the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Miami and lectures at Nova Southeastern University. Please welcome Dr. Juan Riera. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I do much better if I'm asked questions, so if I mention anything you're interested in, yell it out, raise your hand, whatever, let me know. I usually tend to walk around a great deal, so don't be surprised if I grab the microphone and end up walking around a little bit, okay? So, I would also like to thank the folks from the Palm Beach Historical Society for inviting me this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed as much as I'm sure I will. Okay, that's another thing. I've been told I say okay way too often when I speak publicly, so if I start making a habit of it, Yale at me to stop doing it as well. Okay. <laughs> you have the right attitude and spirit in that respect, sir. Very good. So, this year, in just a couple of months, we will be celebrating the 500th anniversary of the visit by Juan Ponce de Leon to La Florida. So, I figure I'll mention a little bit about him. I'll talk some about the maritime history of Florida in the 16th century. I'll also mention a group that's frequently overlooked, the Native Americans that were discovered here in Florida, and do a question answer period, and meander a little bit talking about a few other explorers of the 16th century. Does that sound like a plan to you guys? Yes. All right, very good. So. Let me start off with a question for you guys. What do you know about Juan Ponce de Leon other than he was searching for the Fountain of Youth? And it's been 500 years since he was here. <laughs> Sir. He named Florida? He, he did. Sir? He was the governor of Puerto Rico. Yep. Yes. Very good. Okay. So, he did name Florida, but gave it a longer name. When discovered, he named it Pascuas Florida, flowery Easter, because he found Florida Easter week. In Spanish, Pascuas is the Easter, and properly termed in Spanish, Pascuas Florida. Time of flowers, basically it's spring. Okay. He was military governor of Puerto Rico. As military governor of Puerto Rico, he did request and get permission in search of essentially vast wealth and conquest. If that's your standard, he was not very successful, okay? But he was quite successful in many other ways during the age of exploration, okay? Also, a lot of people fail to realize he actually made two voyages to Florida, not just one. So, let's start off with a little bit of his background and what he ended up accomplishing in his lifetime. When he came to the Americas, he actually came on one of the later voyages of Christopher Columbus. He was instrumental in the military conquest of Puerto Rico. Okay was not particularly happy with that. Puerto Rico, not known for gold, silver, or any type of metal or wealth of that kind. Not known for huge Native American populations that could be exploited for personal benefit. So, not good for him on that um, particular point. Okay, he did gain, gain some fame and some titles as military governor of Puerto Rico. He did request from the King of Spain permission to go out in search of new lands and to conquer new territories for the King of Spain. 
presumably gaining vast amounts of wealth in the process. Now, at this time, getting permission from the King of Spain isn't, hey, I have a really great idea. Why don't you finance this trip for me? A contract with the King of Spain consists of several things with the vast majority of the responsibility being on the intended conqueror. Someone like this gentleman in the front row. Okay. First, you have to tell them generally where you're going to go and look of new territory and conquer. Juan Ponce Leon, basically kind of northwestward. Okay. The king gave him permission. Having gained permission, he would sign a contract and be named Adelantado. Basically translates as forward. He's in charge of going forward and conquering territory. As part of that contract, any explorer is responsible for paying for the ships, all the supplies, and all the men going on the voyage of exploration and conquest. If successful, he gains in return titles and wealth. Titles granted to him by the King of Spain, wealth he discovers. <clears throat> in return for gaining royal titles and having the king endorse his voyage of exploration, the king gets a kickback of any wealth that is found and it becomes a Spanish colony. To give you guys an idea, any mining that is done in any discovered territory, the king gets a, the royal fifth. 20% goes to the king. Any gold, silver, diamonds, emeralds that are taken from conquered peoples, 50% of that goes to the king of Spain. Okay? Not a bad deal if you're the king of Spain. Wouldn't you folks agree? Who okay. was the king of Spain at the time? It was Charles V, who was also Charles I of Spain. Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles I of Spain. Okay. Who kept the books on all the voting? <laughs> well, the one thing the king would do, uh, the gentleman's question was, who keeps the books? The king of Spain always sends along a royal treasurer. <laughs> Basically, his personal representative who keeps the books. He keeps track of what's being spent, just so five, six years down the road, the explorer doesn't come back, well, you know, you were getting your 50% of what I found, but I ended up paying this much, so I should get reimbursed. None of that. The king's representative runs the books. Okay. Yes, sir. Ponce de Leon had to know there was something out here. Somebody had made a previous voyage. There were pilots in the area. That... There, since Columbus had done several other voyages, and there were other explorers, as well as slavers who were going out to other islands, he did have an idea that there was something off in this direction. And actually, what he was technically looking for was the mythical land of Bimini, which we now know is, well, he named the islands Bimini. It's now part of the Bahamas. Okay. He had also heard of the Fountain of Youth, which was located in the land of the giants. Okay, everyone always remembers the Fountain of Youth, but never remembers the Land of the Giants. So, let me go ahead and tell you about that story so we can get it out of the way. As he heads out, he goes through a particularly good channel that he discovers through the Bahamas and does find an island that he does name Bimini, that we still know to this day. By 1513, Many Native Americans throughout the Caribbean have heard from other Native Americans in the Caribbean. Hey, 
bunch of white guys show up looking for shiny metals and stuff. We're not quite sure what that is. Just tell them it's the next island over. <laughs> is, is essentially what the Indians are telling every time the Spanish show up. Okay? You know, pretty straightforward. They're trouble. You don't want to mess with them. Okay? And all the islands of the Bahamas, there's too few of us, and there's nothing here for them to bother with. Just send them on their way. The Indians encountered on Bimini, got half the story. You know, we don't know what that stuff is, we don't have any of it, but um, yeah, that fountain of youth you're looking for, keep going. Ponce Leon moves on, eventually finds a large landmass. Finds it around Easter, names it Pascua Florida. Sails up the coast, to the area around present-day St. Augustine, Florida, and goes ashore. And lo and behold, he finds the land of the giants. Sir, in the aisle, second row, how tall are you? Used to be six. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Let's pretend you're still six. Stand up for a second. Okay. Um, who's... Ma'am, up here. How tall are you? How tall are you, ma'am? Yes. Lay with... Five feet. Okay. Please stand up for a second. She is standing up. <laughs> okay. For a little bit of height comparison, Juan Ponce de Leon was actually the tallest man on his ship at four foot eleven inches tall. Wow. So about an inch shorter than this lady. Thank you, you can have a seat. Sir, you used to be six. When Ponce de Leon arrives around the area of St. Augustine, he runs into the Tumuquin Indians. There's about three different pronunciations, so pronounce it any way you like. And Tumuquin Indians, on average, are about six foot two tall. Okay, so imagine inch shorter than her, couple inches taller than him. Thank you, have a seat. <laughs> Young lady up front, would that be considered the land of giants? I would think so. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, Ponce Leon does find his land of giants. <laughs> Through hand signals, they start figuring out, well, where's the fountain of youth? Sir, you've been on a ship for eight weeks or so. You've found Bimini, you've found this new territory, you've named Pascua Florida. What does your water look like in a barrel without chlorine after eight weeks? <laughs> scurvy. Um, scurvy is a vitamin deficiency. Your water is green and slimy. Okay. How long are you going to live drinking that water? <coughs> Not very long. All of a sudden, they start talking to a couple of Indians. The Indians are like, oh, we don't know about any fountain of youth. We have natural springs that are still commonly found near the coast around St. Augustine. So, it turns out, fresh spring water and compared to green slimy water in a barrel after eight weeks. Which one is a death sentence? Which one's a fountain of youth? <laughs> so there is historical basis for the whole story of Ponce de Leon looking for the fountain of youth and finding it around St. Augustine in the land of the giants. Okay? But it doesn't tell what put that idea in his head in the first place. Yeah, you, you yes, know, you get to correct. The end, it works. But yes. Um, he never actually wrote down exactly where the idea came from. What is generally thought is that it was an idea that he had heard from Native Americans on certain islands of the Caribbean. Okay. Um, same thing, there's other concepts of the type, such as the land of El Dorado, the golden man which dates back hundreds of years as well and spurred exploration around South America. 
So there's certain ideas that kind of, if you pick and choose and start muddling around, that you can find an explanation for them. You know, it's kind of like hearsay. You heard it on the grapevine. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, so after kind of figuring out that, okay, the Fountain of Youth isn't exactly working out, he starts sailing south along the coast of Florida. Along the way, he names another geographic feature, Cabo Cañaveral. Cabo being Cape, and kind of to do an American pronunciation, Canaveral. Actually names Cape Canaveral. Cañaveral, there's some tree growing that looks like sugar cane. Okay, guys, put your thinking caps on. Wood looks like sugar cane, but is not since sugar cane is not natural to the Western world. Very good. Apparently there was a lot of bamboo growing in the area around Cape Canaveral. Bring it a little bit closer to home. He continues sailing southward, and he finds a huge, magnificent bay, which is very shallow, and he decides to name it and map it out. This huge bay reminded him of the Bay of Biscay in northern Spain. Um, my architect friend, you've been down to Miami. Which bay looks like the Bay of Biscay? Which he named. <laughs> you? It's Biscayne Bay. Very good. Okay, Miami sits on Biscayne Bay. He also names a little island. Names it after Biscayne Bay. Nice big trendy area, nice homes, big parks. Um, also where the tennis tournament takes place. Key Biscayne. Kind of figures it's the northernmost key. Continues down starts mapping out and discovers the Florida Keys. But he gives them a different name. He names them Los Martires, the Martyrs. Because all the trees that grow facing the water, the mangroves, all twisted up and such, looks like people who have suffered greatly like martyrs religious influence of the 16th century Spain. Gets to the last of the keys, calls it Gallo Hueso, bone key. Because the only thing he finds on there are bones, apparently of a Indian massacre of some kind. Sails on and finds two other sets of little islands. One, he just maps them out, and nowadays we know them as the Marquesa Keys, 30, 32 miles west of Key West, and about 70 miles west of Key West, he finds the Dry Tortugas. You guys ever heard of the Dry Tortugas? What are the Dry Tortugas famous for nowadays? Two things. The Fort Jefferson. Well, Dr. Mudd is related to Fort Jefferson. Bird watching. Okay. Um, he maps out the islands of the Marquesas, maps out the Dry Tortugas. The name, Dry, very important for the maritime world. No fresh water. Okay. Sir, if you're sailing out in the Caribbean, your water's getting green and slimy and you need fresh water. Are you gonna go to the dry tortugas? It's dry. No, you know, don't bother stopping there. Tortugas, Spanish. Turtles, the big old turtles that you know, weigh two, three, 400 pounds a piece. That's very important because if your water's looking bad, sir, what does your food look like? Keep in mind, no refrigeration, okay? Your vegetables and fruits, how long do they last before they start looking bad and rotting? 
a week, a week and a half, okay? Other stuff, two, three weeks, and, but don't worry, all those little critters growing on the bread and eating the bread, that's your protein for the day, okay? The dry tortugas become very important for fresh food, okay? Some of you probably saw a couple years ago when that series came out about the Napoleonic Wars based on the novels. Gosh, I forget the name. Sure. Yep, exactly. Okay, it turns out that if possible, you take a cow along, maybe a few chickens, and you have some fresh food on the way. Well, easy way to get some fresh food that you get to carry with you, stop by the dry tortugas, pick up a few tortoises, lay them on their back. They don't move, they don't go any place, they stay alive. By week number three or number four, turtle steak and turtle soup. Fresh food, okay? Does not prevent scurvy. To prevent scurvy, you need um, fresh fruits and vegetables. But fresh food is always fresh food, okay? The last thing that was discovered by Ponce de Leon. Didn't quite understand it at the time, but it turned out to be incredibly invaluable to Europeans. He discovered the Florida Gulf Stream. You guys heard, how many of you have heard of the Florida Gulf Stream before? Okay, very good. Um, some of you may actually know it because it's really great for fishing. Any of you fishermen by chance? Okay, got a couple. Well, to the 16th century mariners, the Gulf Stream is a matter of life and death. To get from the Caribbean back to Spain or any other part of Europe, depending on currents and wind, can take you anywhere from about three months to a year. Okay, just let that sink in. You guys who are so used to driving on I-95 at about 90 miles an hour, you are on a sailing ship. The wind is pushing you around. On a really good day, you're going 15 miles an hour. That's a good day. On a bad day, there is no wind. You are sitting still and you're watching your food and water run out. If you are becalmed, that can last a week, week and a half. The Florida Gulf Stream has two great effects. One wonderful for sailors, one really great for you guys nowadays. For sailors, the Florida Gulf Stream pushes you along somewhere between five to 10 miles an hour faster. It goes along the coast of Florida, Georgia and the Carolinas before it shoots northeastward back towards Europe. Guess what? All of a sudden, the three guys in the aisle there who are sailors in the 16th century, their life expectancy has improved dramatically. All of a sudden, their trip across the Atlantic has been reduced to possibly five to six weeks if the wind is good and the currents help them along with the Florida Gulf Stream, okay? For mariners, that is basically the difference between a ship arriving back in Europe with at least part of its crew and everything that's on board or some ship being found with no one on board as they've all died, starved, abandoned ship, okay? Not quite understood by Ponce de Leon, but recorded as he's tried sailing southward with the Gulf Stream pushing against him, okay? The reason I mention it's kind of good for you guys, the Florida Gulf Stream actually has climatic effects on Europe. 
Because of the Florida Gulf Stream, how many of you have ever been to London? Okay, the Gulf Stream keeps London rainy and cloudy rather than under about 15 feet of snow every winter. It is a warm water current that influences the climate in Europe and it's basically what keeps London relatively warm and rather than snow falling, it's rain all the time. So that's the kind of good benefit for you guys if you like to travel to London. Okay. <laughs> Any of you ever suspected that? No. No. Very good. Okay. That was Ponce Leon's first voyage when he encountered Florida. When he first encountered Florida, did not realize that it was a peninsula. Initially, he thought it was a really huge island, probably about the size of Cuba that ran north-south while Cuba ran east-west, essentially. Okay. Goes back to Puerto Rico, continues being military governor of Puerto Rico, actually ends up founding the city of San Juan. Okay. I did not realize this until about exactly a week ago yesterday when I was in San Juan. Um, I lead historic tours and last Tuesday I was in San Juan. I thought he had done this earlier, but he actually founded San Juan in 1521. Coincidentally, the same year he returned to Florida. 1521, Ponce de Leon decides, okay, I had my voyage of exploration. I have found many things. My fame has improved. Kind of figure out the fountain of youth doesn't really exist. It's time for me to go back and conquer Pascuas, Florida. Ends up getting a couple ships, a number of men, lots of farmers, royal representatives, so on and so forth, royal permission, sails back northwestward, and comes up on the southwest coast of Florida. Keep in mind, geographic knowledge at this time is very minimal. He was very lucky. He did not run into the coral reef that runs from Key West up to uh, probably for Lauderdale area, causing his ships to sink. Very lucky, they still hadn't figured out when hurricane season was. <laughs> he didn't get caught by a hurricane, okay? Very lucky, he found his way back. Navigation in the 16th century is still quite rudimentary. It was not until the 1770s that the marine chronometer was invented to help determine where they were north-south wise. Okay. I could probably give you a few more reasons. Just take my word for it. They were very ignorant and very lucky to get back to Florida. He ends up on the southwest coast. We suspect it was Charlotte Harbor. Okay. You have to keep in mind geographic descriptions at the time. Yes, I left on Sunday. I sailed for two or three days. I saw this island headed north and about two days later I came to a beautiful harbor. Sir, if I give you that description and you start off in San Juan, Puerto Rico, can you tell me where Ponce de Leon landed? No, but if I tried it, I'd want a bigger fuel tank. <laughs> <laughs> and an extra fishing rod, I'm sure. So, there's huge debates about where a lot of these early explorers were landing. Okay, for Ponce de Leon on this second voyage, pretty much somewhere between Charlotte Harbor and Tampa Bay. The majority of people think Charlotte Harbor. Ship arrives, 
they get on their longboats. Ponce de Leon is the first one off the ship to claim this territory for the king of Spain. And as soon as he lands, the Calusa Indians head out and attack. Gets an arrow and the shoulder. Gets dragged right back into the longboat and they decide to leave. <laughs> he dies about two weeks later from gangrene in Havana, Cuba. Not a very successful explorer, or was he? Never found any great wealth, never became famous for anything else other than the Fountain of Youth. But he named several places in Florida, Bimini, kind of learned something about the Gulf Stream. Successful explorer, I would argue. Say again? I said he set it up for the next people. Exactly. Thank you very much. That's my segue. <laughs> he did set things up for future explorers. Our next explorer who came to Florida, I'll mention just a couple. There were five or six. Panfilo de Narvaez. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Okay. Panfilo de Narvaez can best be described as an incompetent. It turns out that when Hernan Cortez leaves Cuba to go conquer Mexico. He's under royal contract with the governor of Cuba, which translates into not only is the king getting a cut of whatever he finds, but so does the governor of Cuba. After landing and figuring out that the Aztecs are wealthy beyond all belief, bless you, it wasn't wealth to be sneezed at, sir. Um, <laughs> He does legal changes, founds Veracruz, which he makes himself governor of and allows him to cut out the gov governor of Cuba. Kind of simplifying it for the story. Um, governor of Cuba does not like it and sends Panflu de Narvaez to go arrest Cortez and bring him back to Cuba. Lands in Veracruz, Cortez hears about this, goes back with a token force, talks to all of Panfilo de Narvaez's men, and says, yeah, you guys are gonna help him arrest me and take me back to Cuba, or you guys can join me and we're gonna be wealthy beyond all belief. They abandon Narvaez, who tries to single-handedly arrest Cortez and basically loses his eye in the process goes back disgraced to Cuba. So at this point, he actually, I've seen drawings of him, he looks like a wonderful pirate. He's got a nice Spanish helmet, a big old eye patch, and a scruffy old beard. King of Spain feels sorry for him and says, you know what, lead an expedition, go conquer Florida. Gets together a force, lands, we think, somewhere in the Tampa Bay area. Now, the man, well, let me ask you, sir, you've landed in Florida, you have a couple ships, and you decide you're gonna march overland into Florida. What are you, what's the first thing you're gonna bring with you? Mosquito repellent. <laughs> <laughs> Mosquito repellent, yes. That would be the first thing, yes. Okay. You Indian would. Guide. Huh? An Indian guide. An Indian guide. He ends up getting himself an Indian guide, forcibly, which makes the Indian guide unreliable, of course. <laughs> Wouldn't you bring some food along as well? Yeah. Yeah. He ends up, oh, I'll take three or four days worth of food. And you guys on the ship, from what I understand, there's a large, good bay for you guys to anchor in up north. 
So I'll meet you guys up there in four or five days. Any of you ever spend much time up in the panhandle? <laughs> Tell me, which bay was he referring to? Okay, um, the two ships head up there, they drop anchor, and they wait around for about six months and figure he and all his men are dead and go back to Cuba. Okay, probably not the summer vacation they were expecting either. <laughs> He starts marching inland, makes it to the Gulf Coast, about 25 miles south of modern-day Tallahassee. Okay. What is now known as, any of you know the Tallahassee area? Okay. You guys know where San Marcos de Apalachee is? <coughs> you do? Oh, wow. I'm impressed. Okay. He ends up making it there. The Appalachian Indians attack him relentlessly. They eventually melt down their weapons to make spikes and nails, eat their horses, use horse skin to make sails, and about 300 of them get on these rafts out into the Gulf Coast. And they really wish they would have known when hurricane season was. Big storm catches them. A few of the rafts sink, overturn, everyone's drowning. One of the rafts actually washes ashore. Gulf Coast of Texas. Hey, we'll just walk back to Mexico. Of the whole expedition, four survivors. <laughs> One of them is actually a slave. Um, Mexican officials, can you lead us back? Well, one of the survivors, oh my God, we've seen wonderful, glorious things. There's treasure. It's like a whole new Mexico. Get it? State of New Mexico? Really? Can you lead us back there? Oh, no. I'm never going back. I'll sell you my slave. He knows the way back. That's another story. I'll leave you hanging with that until next time. <laughs> All right. That led to the Coronado Expedition. Okay. I'll let you know that much. Okay. So, Poncion has led to the Narvaez Expedition and they're still totally ignorant of bays, rivers, and everything around the peninsula of Florida. One contribution he does make, they figure out, hey, it's not an island, it's a peninsula. And that leads to one more explorer that I'm sure you've all heard of, or at least the car. Have you guys ever heard of Hernando de Soto? Okay, Hernando de Soto ends up landing. We do know most definitely his explanations were a lot better. He lands in the Tampa Bay area. He's learned a few things from previous explorers. He will not starve in Florida. What he ends up doing is he brings enough food to feed his 600 men and the food walks itself. Anyone here a former farmer by chance? An animal that reproduces very quickly. No, it's not cattle. Pigs. He actually introduces pigs to North America. He's got a couple of herders who just make sure the pig, the pig herds go along with the expedition. Of course, along the way, a few pigs kind of run off and do what little pigs will do, and all of a sudden we have new wildlife in the southeastern United States. And I'll kind of tell you something, a little interesting side note. Um, 
He eventually makes it all the way out towards Texas, along with the pigs. The Arkansas Razorbacks originated with DeSoto and his pigs. Okay, DeSoto ends up going north, eastward, and then hooking leftward, and eventually ends up, 1539, in the area of modern-day Tallahassee and celebrates the first Christmas in North America within the city limits of modern-day Tallahassee. He knew that he was ignorant about the maritime world of Florida, but he was smart militarily. He knew how to survive on a campaign, thus he brought along his own food source. Okay. Um, any of you familiar with the Tallahassee area? Okay. Um, you've been to the state capitol? Sure. Exactly one mile east of the state capitol on Appalachie Parkway, if you're kind of at the state capitol looking down, the right hand side, that was his winter encampment for five months. Okay. Not to prolong the story too extensively. His expedition spends five months there, heads northeastward, makes it up to the Carolinas, takes a left turn, discovers the Mississippi River, crosses over into Louisiana, Texas. Um, he dies near the Mississippi. He aggravates and irritates every Native American tribe he runs across. <laughs> and the only ones who really, well, the only ones that really scare him are the Appalachians of Florida. And he has one huge battle with the Mobila Indians. Mobile, Alabama is named after them. His expedition eventually makes canoes, heads down the Mississippi, heads back to the Caribbean, and they've come to a major conclusion and that they spread to anyone who will listen to them. Florida is a worthless wilderness, okay? There's no gold, there's no silver, there's no huge Native American populations we can exploit. The trees, everything in this, what is now the southeastern United States is nothing like the province of Castile in Spain. Why anyone would settle there since there's nothing worthwhile is beyond us. King of Spain says, thank you very much. We have no interest in Florida until 1565. I'm not going to touch on that too much. I saw your lecture series. You will be hearing a lot about Menendez and his settlement of Florida. Okay. The Spanish eventually found St. Augustine and a series of religious missions, basically to protect Florida for themselves, to protect Spanish treasure fleets sailing by. Okay. You'll hear more about that in one of the future lecture series speakers. Um, last little section I want to talk about are the Native Americans that were discovered in Florida by these explorers. Weren't really discovered, they knew they were here before the Spanish told them they were here. Um, the vast majority of people, if you ask them, well, what Indians lived in Florida? The vast majority, probably way more than 90%. Oh yeah, the Seminoles and the Miccosukees. They're actually latecomers to Florida. They did not start moving into Florida into the early to mid 1700s. Okay. The Native Americans discovered by the Spanish when they first encountered Florida. There were approximately a dozen different Native American groups. With the exception of one, they all lived 
off of maritime resources. Shellfish, fishing, lobster, a few actually hunted during migration periods, small whales. Okay, so they lived off basically high protein diet as well as some gathering nuts, um, wild fruit, things of that sort. Native Americans in Florida were primarily matrilineal. Means, ladies, you owned everything. The ladies inherited everything. When you met a fine young man like this gentleman to your left, ma'am, and you got married, he moved to your town and in with your family. Okay. <laughs> oh, obviously a good European background. You liked it when the Spanish made them turn to be paternalistic rather than maternalistic. Okay. There was only one Native American tribe that lived differently than the other about 11. Those were the Appalachian Indians. All other 11 Native American tribes added up to maybe a couple hundred thousand Native Americans because they had very low population density because they ate mostly seafood. The Appalachian, unlike all the others, actually practiced agriculture and they had corn. A lot more food, thus a lot more kids, much higher population. With a much higher population and a stable food source, they actually had a warrior class that they developed. Whenever the Spanish met any of the other 11 Native American tribes, hey, they're a pushover. They encountered the Appalachian. They actually have a war chief. They actually practice war and the Spanish learn to fear them every time they encounter them. Their reputation was so widespread and so fierce, one major geographic feature is named after them in the United States, the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, I'll leave you with that little tidbit since it's already four o'clock. Do we have any questions, comments, compliments, or insults? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm wondering, I skipped a beat as to how the focus became on the west coast of Florida rather than, you know, I've heard you say that, but then it seems like thereafter they were going around to the west coast. What, ha why, what happened to the east coast? The reason for that was that for navigational purposes, mm -hmm. the west coast was a lot easier because on the East Coast, yes, you have the benefit of the Florida Gulf Stream that is pushing you along and it's quite helpful. But what happens if you can't slow down or can't stop where you're, head, where you're going? <laughs> Imagine you're trying to get off exit 156 on I-95, you're going 95 miles an hour and all of a sudden there goes the stop. There goes your exit. So basically, West Coast is good because you can stop, you can get off, and you can go by land. And presumably, once you've done whatever, you kind of easily loop around the bottom and catch the Gulf Stream. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You said that uh, the explorers had to equip their uh, expeditions at their own expense. Correct. Where did Ponce de Leon get all this money from? For the ships, for the soldiers? Um, they usually would use either money from previous expeditions. Um, for example, this gentleman, he's just a common soldier in an expedition that's conquered the Aztecs, the Incas, name your group. Legally, he is entitled to a certain share of the money. He figures out, hey, that's a good spot to go explore. If he's got enough money, he outfits it all himself. 
If he doesn't, he gets together with three or four other common soldiers. They pool their money and make promises. I know there's a fortune to be made. I can't pay you now, but come along, provide your own horse, your own armament, and you get a bigger share once we conquer. So it was a combination of accumulated savings, partnerships, and promises, IOUs. Basically, if we succeed, since you kind of put up more of your own stuff, you get a bigger share. If we don't succeed, oh well, we all die together. Um, De Soto actually was one of the wealthiest men in the world. He had been on the Cortez expedition. After Cortez gave him his share, he became essentially a subcontractor, conquered Nicaragua and parts of Guatemala, and eventually was second in command under the um, Francisco Pizarro in conquering the Incas. He was wealthy beyond all belief. He had royal titles granted to him, and he married one of the wealthiest widows in Spain. Sir? Did these explorers carry horses for ground transportation? Or if, if they could afford it, yes. Horses are an expensive item, okay? More so than a car nowadays. When there is a major conquest, the conquistador is entitled to a certain share. His lieutenants, a certain share. Horsemen get a certain share, and then common foot soldiers get a share. Usually, horsemen, if they provide their own horse, get twice as much as a foot soldier, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm getting the signal, the big hook, I'm being pulled off stage. I will be, oh, oh, I'm sorry, he has a question. Oh, this is gonna be a tough one. 16th century Spanish ships, where did the sailors sleep? Um, they usually would sleep below decks, frequently, and the sleeping arrangements were not very good. Okay. Spanish sailing ships, for starters, well, all ships of that time period, they all leak. Basically, the very bottom of the ship, there's always water floating around, okay? There commonly are rats on board ships. At the beginning of the time period, you basically sleep in any old corner you can find. The concept of hammocks was a big benefit because you could hang them and during the day you just kind of move them over to the hook and just let them hang there out of the way. That was actually a Native American idea that the, most Europeans copied. Okay, Eventually the English, rather than just having hammocks that are basically fiber, they come up with the idea of cloths. Basically, small sail, you string it up and you can still fold it out of the way. And they usually would have certain sections or a deck for sleeping um, once hammocks came to be used. But prior to that, um, any old corner. Keep in mind also, sailing ships of the 16th century were quite small. Columbus came on three ships and it was 80 some sailors that came with him. About 30 sailors on each ship. If you see the modern day replicas of the ships that periodically sail around, they look like oversized modern yachts. They are very small ships. Um, an assignment for you. Mention it to the next month's group. There is a ship, a copy being built in Malaga, Spain currently, that was used by Jose Galvez. Galveston is named after him. It's a copy of the ship he used 
to conquer Pensacola um, during the American Revolution. That ship, once completed, is coming over to the New World. It will be making a stop in St. Augustine. The Lighthouse Museum there has a very huge maritime archaeology program and has volunteers who are actually making the boats for the ship. It will stop, spend a few days there, be open to the public, pick up its boats, and it's eventually going to Galveston and be, will be based there. Okay, They're putting out a lot of good information on sailing ships of the time. Also, um, I put on the back table there a few pamphlets and stuff. A lot of information as far as ship construction can be read up and learned about from the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research. Um, a lot of it is displayed as well as artifacts, not necessarily from the 16th century, but at four museums throughout the state. The Museum of Florida History in Tallahassee, the Mel Fisher Museum, and the McClarty Museum in Sebastian, Florida, exit 156, and the other better known Mel Fisher Museum in Key West, a lot on maritime history. And there, the Mel Fisher people out of Key West are currently doing underwater archaeology on a ship that is out in the Bahamas that is believed to have been one of the ships that was under the command of Pedro Menendez de Aviles in 1565. We have more time for one more question. Okay, I'll let you pick it so I don't look biased. Um, I've been to the museums in Norway and Sweden, mm -hmm. so I've seen the Viking ships. Also, they were very short people. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were under five feet. How does the uh, ships in size compare to a Viking ship? Well, they would have been larger than a Viking ship. A Viking ship was most often two decks. Spanish ships used in the 16th century would have been three or four decks. As far as length, probably probably about 20% longer. And the major difference would have been in sails. Viking ships generally had one, possibly two squ um, square rigged sails. Basically one really huge sail that's square. One or two of those. The Spanish had the benefit of having access and knowledge of the technology of ships of the Atlantic and the North Sea as well as the Mediterranean. Ships in the Mediterranean were generally galleys, long ships with, ro with rows available, with rowing. Um, they also knew from the Mediterranean lanteen sails, which is the type of sails that Arabs used to use. Okay, kind of triangular. They also had knowledge of the shipping used in the North Sea, which tended to be much bulkier, basically a huge bathtub with square sails of that sort. The Spanish and the Portuguese tended to start developing new types of ships that were a little bit longer, more slender, kind of like they would see in the Mediterranean, trying to keep as much of the roominess for storage of food and supplies, as well as material to be brought back from the New World that would be found in the North Sea. And they started taking the square sails found in North Sea ships and adding more sails of the lanteen type, which were triangular. That way they could catch more wind and pick up more speed. So the Portuguese and the Spanish start molding these two traditions to get sleeker ships that can still carry a great deal of material and adding more sails of different types to them for greater speed. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll be around for a few minutes should you have any other questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.